so the reason I'm here this morning is because this is what I do for a living. I'm the, I'm, a, I'm the department chair of the humanities and philosophy department at Southwestern College, where I've been teaching for 32 years, and I teach things like world religions, Asian philosophy, world mythology, ethics, and other courses related to that. And so naturally, I cross paths with uh, all of the great wisdom literature of the world, and it's. Uh, it's, it's, it's my privilege to be here this morning in this really fantastic place to uh, call to the order of this meeting of heretics who <laughs> uh, wish to live just inside the edge of the outside and take a look at a text that, as you well know, is not in your Bible. And it's a long story. We're just going to sketch through that today. I want to use most of our time to just read passages from the Gospel of Thomas together. So that's the bulk of the slides that we'll see. And one last comment before we jump in. If anybody would like a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, um, I'd be happy to email it to you. Just write me, uh, email me at peterbolland at pops.net, C-O-X dot N-A-T. And say, can I have the Gospel of Thomas PowerPoint and I will email it to you? So there's a lot of text on these slides. That way you can kind of maybe go over it. Or even better, I'll wave the book around. Uh, all the text and passages we're going to study come from this little book. Uh, it's still in print, the cover may look a little different. This is the Gospel of Thomas, the hidden sayings of Jesus, interpretation by Harold Bloom. So there's a number of different interpretations and translations. I'm particularly fond of this edition. Um, on the left page is the original Coptic, and on the right page is the English translation. So uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff for your library shelf. So let's put this work today, let's put this inquiry today in the context of our wider experience in the Christian universe. And I'm going to present for uh, 45, 55 minutes, maybe 50 minutes or so, I don't know. And then we have a microphone, and we're going to open the floor up to anybody who has questions or comments. Um, to, uh, we can discuss whatever uh, you want to discuss for a little bit at the end, uh, as long as we make it to church by 10 30. So, this is, of course, Christ the Redeemer. That's the name of the statue. Right, overlooking the beautiful city of Rio de Janeiro. And at the heart of this idea is, in theology, a term we use called transactional um, atonement. And that is the doctrine, the chance to talk for the doctrine that most Christians walking around in the world hold dear. Namely, that the death of Jesus on the cross is a mystical, transformational uh, one off. A uh, miraculous moment where a God becomes human, allows himself to be sacrificially uh, killed, and through that death, a ransom is paid. That's the earliest theological understanding. There are other understandings that come up later in the Middle Ages that, that this isn't about a ransom being paid at all, and so I'm not going to get into the weeds there. But that's the mainstream view that. that that passage from John, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in order that we might have everlasting life. And, and, and most of the Christians that I cross paths with um, aren't interested in theology or the work of the Jews. They have that, that basic understanding that this rabbi that lived 2,000 years ago died so that I can come out from underneath the mantle of a debilitating incompletion and sinfulness and and, and, and myriad flaws in order to be reconnected with God. So Jesus died as a transactional process. Now that's one and very, uh, and very common understanding that we see around the world. What we're going to encounter today might be a little different than that. And so that idea is not new to us. It is the cardinal emphasis of most Christianities that we are rich and sinners, we cannot fix ourselves. But the good news is, God became human, and through this ritual sacrifice, made a bridge for us called grace for us to walk in cross and be reconnected to, to the sacred source from which we and all things come. And so these modern images capture very vividly that narrative, that, that suffering, that, that uh, 
great, great sacrifice in the making of Jesus then along those lines. A couple of quick book recommendations that are part of the thinking that kind of got me looking into the Gospel of Thomas more, apart from the book itself, of course. On the left, you have uh, an early book by a, early, a very prolific author, Bart, Bart Ehrman, a professor of religious studies, I think at Chapel Hill in North Carolina, I believe. And he grew up as a fundamentalist Christian, believing that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. And he went to a college that earned that view, the Moody Bible Institute. And then he started thinking, well, if I'm a fundamentalist who believes that the Bible is the literal inherent word of God, then I'm not satisfied reading it in English. Right? I want to learn Hebrew and Syriac and Aramaic and, and Koine Greek and, and find the, ancient, the most ancient physical copies of the fragments. And then like every other Bible scholar, what he ran into when he did all of that at Princeton Theological Seminary, and he went to the archives in Berlin and and other places where the oldest frag the oldest existing fragments of the gospels exist were studied by scholars. What he realized is that what most of us already know, that is that there is no original copy of these gospels. The, the oldest intact copy of the gospels are from the second century. And when you go back deeper than that, you have just fragments, and all of them obviously are hand transcriptions. And what this book does is really remarkable. It, it, it documents quite thoroughly that process of hand transcription. That um, patrons would hire 50 scribes to sit in a room and make 50 or 100 or 400 <coughs> copies of the Gospel of Mark. And they would be instructed by their benefactor to alter a, a passage to make, it, to make it line up with a passage from the Gospel of Matthew. Or they would make mistakes and just drop words. Or Sometimes entire stories would appear that didn't exist in early versions. My favorite story from the Gospel of John, which in many ways is the most problematic, being the latest gospel, is John 8, the story of the adulterous woman. And who doesn't love that story, right? Uh, and, and where the, the Pharisees bring it and a woman caught in the very act of adultery and kind of throw her down in the dirt in front of Jesus and say, The law of Moses says we should stone her. What do you say? And, and then you can have our from there. So that scene is not in the oldest fragments of the Gospel of John. It appears later than that. Now you could conclude what you want. Either it just was lost and restored, or somebody made it up, or you know, you want your own there. But these are the challenges that Bart Ehrman really spotlights. The other book, The Third Jesus, asks from a very, very different perspective, Deepak Chopra. Not a theologian, not a Bible scholar, I, I guess not a Christian, but a very prominent teacher today of mostly East Asian or Southeast Asian Indian Vedanta consciousness vis-a-vis -vis, um, his, his interest lately is in you know, quantum physics and a lot of uh, modern science and, and a prolific author again. And Chopra put a little book together called The Three Jesus that is quite charming. And the three Jesuses are, the first one is the historic Jesus that we know almost nothing about. The second one he calls the ecclesiastical Jesus. That's the Jesus who comes down to us through the teachings of the church, all that transactional atonement stuff. And then the third Jesus, he says, is the one we have ignored. And in Chopra's sort of world religion's perspective, that is the mystical teacher of non-duality. <laughs> So boy, did he get a lot of blowback from more traditional Christian voices. However, he kind of goes through the Gospels, including the non-canonical Gospels like Thomas, and puts together uh, some scriptural support for the idea that what if Jesus is a teacher of awakening consciousness, who is in the vernacular of his Jewish vocabulary, teaching it in a kind of obviously dualistic, monotheistic uh, set of terms. So I mention these two books just as provocation for the kind of thinking that I, oh, I have a whole slide about that. I should look at my slide before I start talking. Anyway, you'll have that in your size when I send it to you for the last book. So that's what I just said. Nice cover, too. I like that. So what we're thinking about, then, is this question, where can we turn for the best answers to our many questions? And, and everyone agrees that the Gospels, the canonical Gospels in our New Testaments are a really, really great place to start. They have 
form the core of our understanding. And those dates you see, there are the general consensus dates of when those books were written. So we know this right away that Jesus, if he died around 32 or so, it's a good 30 plus years until the first gospel is written around 65. And that, of course, is a heady time. That's when the Romans were attacking Jerusalem and destroying it. This is the destruction of the Second Temple. An apocalyptic, cataclysmic time in Jewish consciousness. Tens of thousands of Jews are being slaughtered by the Romans. It is the beginning of the end of biblical Judaism. And it is the beginning of what we call rabbinical Judaism. The question becomes now, can Judaism survive on the road? Can it survive away from the temple? And Jews scatter. This is called the diaspora. So in this horrific time, somebody put pen to paper and said, I need to tell the story of this remarkable first century rabbi, Jesus, and his followers and his sayings. And apparently, whoever wrote Mark had a copy of some sayings of this. Um, and then Matthew came along five to 10 years later. 90% um, of Mark is in Matthew, but Matthew, of course, extends the stories. And Mark has no birth story. Mark, as you know, maybe begins with the baptism. Page one, there's Jesus in his 30s getting baptized. There's no childhood or there's no information about his lineage, which is such a big deal in Matthew and in Luke. Matthew then, which is also the most Jewish of the Gospels, takes great pains to document Jesus' descendancy from King David, which is one of the boxes you have to check to be the real Jewish Messiah. And many other clues throughout the Gospel of Matthew point to its intended audience, namely Judaism. And for the first time, we have a birth story. And Luke also, most famously, tells the birth story. That's the one in the Charlie Brown special that Linus reads on stage. And that's really, really beautiful. At Christmas, we turn to Luke quite often. And then lastly, of course, the Gospel of John, um, maybe 100 years after the birth of Jesus, and all kinds of questions come up. Um, were these books written by the disciples who walked with Jesus? But this is this is a point of contention, isn't it? Um, to look at those numbers, people just don't live that long, if those numbers are correct. And then the question becomes, how do we come up with these numbers? Because you heard me say a few minutes ago, the oldest copies of these things are from the second century. So how do we know, or what makes us claim that those are accurate authorship dates. Well, it has to do with historical linguistic analysis. Ancient Koine Greek, in which these texts were written, um, evolved, just as our language evolves, decade by decade by decade. The word Twitter, or the word tweet, to tweet something, um, that started around, what, 2009? And it's over now. Twitter doesn't exist anymore. We're trying to figure out a new word. You know, I X something, I do isn't have the same name. And so 200 years from now, scholars will read our stuff, and when someone says, yeah, I tweeted it, they'll be able to place that statement in a very specific time frame. And guess what? That happens in all cultures. That language picks up new vocabulary, and then that vocabulary fades, and smarter, less lazy people than me actually go through everything and document these efforts. So that's one of the methods that scholars use to come up with this. I would not use the word proof, but the preponderance of evidence starts to, starts to show something. And then there's the other thing to notice, and that is the, the evolving portrait. In Mark, we don't have Jesus born as the incarnation of God. He is a baptized and becomes the emissary of God. If we didn't have Matthew, Luke, and John, we only have Mark, Gone would be the doctrine of the incarnation, of the virgin birth, and all of those pieces. But then in Matthew, Jesus' divinity gets a little bigger. And then in Luke, it gets bigger still. By the time we get to John, we, we have the full-throated affirmation of the divinity of Christ. That Jesus not only comes from God, but Jesus is God. And that, I, that doctrine of identity took a few decades to to reach its full flowering. And that's what we see in the Gospel of John. Now, in traditional Christianity, we read all four Gospels together and interchangeably because, like, 
as if they are facets, the windows into the same house through different ideas, through different perspectives, and that's a, a, a wonderful way to approach them. Um, for outsiders who, who would not be uh, looking at it as Christians, they see something a little more ordinary, and that is just how stories evolve and grow over time. When you, when you go fishing and you catch a fish the first time, you that yeah, was this big. And then a few hours later, you're telling the story again, and all of a sudden, your hands get a little bit bigger. And then by the fourth time you tell it, I caught a fish, it was this big. So it's just what we do. We see this in mythology all over the world. It happened with the story of the Buddha. And you know more and more magical elements start coming in, mythological elements. So do with all of that what you will. But this is all context to help us approach the text that we're about to read, the passages we're about to read from Thomas, which is going to do something very different. And the question that's sort of in the center of the room here, that I don't know if we can answer it perfectly, but it's fun to play with it, is why isn't Thomas in the Bible? What claims does it make that don't fit with the four canonized? Because it got intentionally excluded along with dozens of other texts in the editing process. And we'll think about that in a moment, too. But there's one key idea to think about as well. The kingdom of God, sometimes called the kingdom of heaven. It's something Jesus talks about a lot. It's something people ask Jesus about a lot. It's a common phrase in Jerusalem during the time of Jesus' life. Um, Reza Aslan's book, Zealot, does a really wonderful job of uh, uh, unpacking what the, what the life and times of Jerusalem were like during Jesus' life, what the different sects in Judaism were, which ones were aligned to the Romans, which ones were more on the zealot side that were engaged in guerrilla warfare against the Roman occupiers. This whole rich range of perspectives. And so what does the kingdom of God mean in Jewish consciousness in the first century? You know, um, is it, is it a physical place? Is it a political entity? And in much Jewish consciousness, it seems to be. Think about this. The Jews in Jerusalem have been occupied by the Greeks and now the Romans. And this had been going on for a couple of centuries. So they were living under the occupation of a foreign empire. And naturally, the longing would grow more and more keen to make this real great again. Uh, to, to get it to get it back from these conquering this conquering empire, you know that Star Wars energy, empires versus rebels, and so why wouldn't you want to make the kingdom of God real again? So in many Jewish people's minds, the kingdom of God meant the expulsion of the Romans and the reestablishment of the great kingdom of David and the rest of those great Jewish kings. Sometimes when you hear the phrase, it seems to sound like, well, the kingdom of God is going to come. Jesus talks about the future, that when the kingdom of God comes, and so on. Um, and he also, Jesus also seems to suggest in other passages when he says in Luke that you know, people ask him, where's the kingdom of heaven? He says, don't look over here and don't look over there. And, and Luke says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And now it seems to leave the door open to interpret this mysterious phrase as perhaps a label for a condition of consciousness, which is already within us, only outward turn, we're unaware of it in that sense. What Deepak Chopra would say is, that starts to sound like the Buddhist metaphor of ordinary consciousness being a kind of sleep. And when we awaken, and the word Buddha in Sanskrit means to wake up, the Buddha is the one who woke up. When we awaken, we realize what we are and what all of this is. So the metaphor in Buddhism is asleep or awake. Here, it is this kingdom of heaven idea that we generally have access to. So we can do hours and hours on this question. How was our current Bible put together? It's a long story that unfolds over many centuries. That isn't our task today, but it's good to to see or to sort of pause anyway, at least notice a couple of headlines. The Bible is not really a book, is it? It's a library of books written, you know, over 50 books written by over 40 people in uh, three continents over a 1,500-year period in a variety of languages. 
So who put this archive of all these scattered intersects into one volume, bound it in beautiful leather, and said this book is canonized or officially the word of God? That obviously was consciously carried out by the early, as we call them, church fathers, as late as the, the fifth century. And then that book, the Bible, was parallel with the emergence of an institution founded, as all institutions are, to keep a mission alive, to keep an orientation alive, to keep a set of practices and truths alive. But all of us who work and have worked in large institutions know that there's a structural challenge that eventually, and this is nobody's fault, and I don't think it's certainly it's not a, a nefarious plot, but institutions, if you aren't careful, and if they aren't carefully guided, have a way of sort of pushing the original mission aside and making the survival and power of the institution the mission. And this is something you can experience from the inside as you participate in processes that, that begin benignly and turn into um, something else. And so then prominent voices in the institution begin to assert rather vocally and rather powerfully that the church and the truth are, are interchangeably identical and that anybody who questions truth, take, uh, church teachings, is, is attacking God's truth and has to be dealt with accordingly. And as many uh, Christians, progressive Christians, and others today openly uh, wonder, um, did Christianity lose its way in the third century when it became alive with imperial power? What began as an ideology of the dispossessed, of um, those with the least, uh, worked its way to become the religion of power and empire. And what, what was lost by that? transformation. And as uh, one of my Saudi exchange uh, students, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be a community college professor, and I often have groups of Saudi uh, exchange students in my classes, and it's so wonderful to have conversations about all this and everything else with them, coming from one of the most conservative Muslim countries in the world, and boy, the things they learn in school about Judaism. Right. And the things they learn in school about Christianity, because every country has its has its job, doesn't it? You know, mm -hmm. to tell its story as the as the true place, and everybody else as the outliers. But they they um, surprised me and by their open mindedness and by their insightfulness, and it was from them really that I can uh, it, it was it was in a conversation with one of them that I got this. The sort of narrative that says, you know, religions always begin in such beautiful ways. Truth teaching is stated in the most humbling, healing way. And then the founder dies, and then somebody tries to write down their stuff. And then uh, a committee forms to keep the writings and the teachings alive. And then they have to start raising money. And then all of a sudden, who's in and who's out? And then after a while, the institution takes over and, and doctrine becomes dogma. He said, and that dogma often becomes horror. As incalculable savagery is committed by those whose self-appointed task is to keep the teachings of Jesus alive. And, and intellectually, of course, this makes no sense to any of us. But we see again and again throughout history, in many, in many examples, in many religious traditions, those evolutionary processes. So, Let's get to the Gospel of Thomas, and it's incredible. We found a photograph of the moment. <laughs> but there's a really fun story here. That, so the Gospel of Thomas was a giant papyrus scroll that was found in uh, 1945 in Egypt. Uh, they, some, uh, some Egyptians were riding their camels along the base of some cliffs where they were collecting bat guano bat droppings for use as fuel in their stoves and in their ovens. And one of them, his name was Muhammad Ali, <laughs> common name, and he, he found a big, uh, a big vase, and inside was a tightly wrapped pack of papyrus scrolls. And he said, these are going to be worth some money in town. 
So he just put them under his arm and he rode around on his camel mm -hmm. for a few weeks. They did get damaged a little bit. You know, he wasn't schooled in archaeological uh, preservation. But when those texts finally got to the antiquities dealers and then to scholars, people realized, hmm, this is really a big find. And we know it today as the Nagi Mahdi Library, and that was some other texts. It's akin to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So these are first century scrolls that came to life. And uh, just a few years ago, really, in terms of our 2000 year history, they were written in Coptic, which is an Egyptian -like language related to Greek. And this particular copy is dated to around 80 to 120, sorry, 80, 180 to 220. However, um, again, further analysis shows that it was a, tra a Coptic translation of a Greek copy that we don't have. That goes back to the first century. Um, we knew that the Gospel of Thomas existed um, ever since 1897 when a Greek fragment was found. But this was a huge deal to find the whole thing. So that's what you get when you buy this book here. Um, you get the Coptic original, and then you get the uh, English renderings as well. Now, it's unlike the canonized Gospels in, in just a couple of really interesting ways. No narrative, no story at all. Uh, just a collection of sayings. So that makes it like the Dhamma Jin, if you're familiar with that, or the Dhammapada of Buddhism. These are just collections of wisdom sayings. There's no events, there's no travels, and Jesus does well, as you can read. Once you take all the narrative out, there's no virgin birth, there's no healing of the sick, there's no raising of the dead, there's no walking on water, there's no calming of storms, there's no death and resurrection. All of that is missing from the Gospel of Thomas. It wasn't of interest to whoever put this together. And some scholars argue the Gospel of Thomas bears a resemblance to a hypothetical text that we don't have, that Bible scholars talk about, called Q. And Q is short for German Kell, meaning source. So you may wonder, why do Mark, Matthew, and Luke in particular, what we call the synoptic gospels, why are they so similar? Why do they share over 450 passages or something like that? Well, as I mentioned before, Matthew had a copy of Mark, and 90% of Mark comes right into Matthew. But how did, how did the other alignments happen? Scholars hypothesize there must have been a source text that we don't have that was just the sayings of Jesus. That's a hypothesis that helps us explain the incredible alignment between the Synoptic Gospels and even John. Is this Q? Uh, no, nobody's really saying that. But it, it, as a literary structure, it kind of resembles what we think Q might be, which is, again, no narratives or stories, just somebody taking notes when Jesus is talking and capturing all those awesome parables and sayings. This gospel was used by early followers of Jesus. I'm, I'm avoiding the word Christian here because that's really a second century word. Um, Christian are the followers of Christ, and a lot of you must know that the early followers of Jesus were mostly Jews, some Greeks, who uh, they just called themselves followers of the way, which is very Mandalorian, <laughs> which is kind of cool also. And Tao, from the Taoist tradition, also means way, followers of the way. So there were followers of the way in Iraq, Iran, Syria, Egypt, northern India, who used Thomas. In fact, the disciple Thomas, as you know, after, after the ascension, uh, the, the disciples scattered, most of them died. Uh, the, the many were killed in prison. We you know that Thomas went to India. There's a temple in India devoted to the disciple of Thomas. So there were early Thomas followers in these places, very, very early in the story. So a close reading of, of Thomas is what we're going to do now for the next bit. And I want to organize it around uh, four themes, Gnosis, Esoteric Teachings, Realized Eschatology, and God Identification. That last one's very brief. So really just mainly these first three. Let me, let me define them. Uh, gnosis is a, a Greek word meaning um, knowledge, briefly, but also a particular kind of knowledge, the knowledge of direct experience. For example, I've heard of Kim Kardashian. I, I've seen her picture. 
uh, in the doctor's office in People Magazine. Um, I, I've seen her on social media. I, I know about this Kardashian family. I've never watched any of those shows or anything. But I do not have gnosis of Kim Kardashian. I've not sat next to her on planes in London and had tea and swap and swap life stories with her. So gnosis is, is, is not just intellectual conceptual knowledge, it's, it's that lived embodied experiential knowing. Esoteric teachings, a lot of you know what that means, esoteric as opposed to exoteric. Esoteric simply means inner or hidden. Uh, exoteric means outer or for the public. And I, we all notice that in religions there are often both. There are the, there are the messages designed for the un, uninitiated. And then after you get initiated and are inside for a while, now you're ready to kind of receive some of the deeper teachings not because you know, you're special, but because you've done the foundational work, you're now prepared to understand those things. If you gave the esoteric teachings to the public, well, Jesus calls it casting pearls before a swine, mm -hmm. which is a really powerful and rather insulting <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> People are only ready to receive what they're ready to receive. So, Esoteric and exoteric isn't about secret teachings or elitism or keeping anybody out. It's just the recognition of readiness. There's a lot in Thomas about esoterica. Realized eschatology, another uh, theology word for you there. Eschatology has to do with the end of the times. And realized eschatology is the, is the claim that the end times are happening right now. They are here now. So let's look for these three or four themes in the passages of Thomas. So here is the very first line, called Prologue and One. These are the hidden sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Judas Thomas the twin recorded. And he said, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. We assume that that quote is of Jesus, but it's ambiguous, <coughs> isn't it? Is that Thomas the scribe who's saying that? Um, Judas Thomas the twin. There are ancient teachings that Judas is the twin of Jesus. Literally, we know that Jesus had siblings, um, uh, maybe more than a few. And that's another thing. Bart Ehrman is so delightfully, uh, so delightfully put that in, in his book, Misquoting Jesus. That's another thing you see in the evolution of those early fragments, Jesus' brothers and sisters disappearing from the texts. Why? Because as the Roman church began to develop the doctrine in the second and third century of the virgin birth, an idea unheard of in the first and second century, it became necessary to eliminate Jesus' siblings. Because in Roman Catholic teaching, Mary was a virgin when she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And after the birth of Jesus, her virginity was restored, and her virginity is perpetual. That's not a teaching Protestants hold. In many Protestant churches, Jesus was born of a virgin, but after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph had a bunch of kids the ordinary way. So it's fascinating to see in the early scriptural evolution that Jesus' siblings, which are problematic in, in some Catholic circles, uh, begin to disappear from, from the text. So all of that comes to, comes to mind when you think about this. But, this is the thrust of the book. This is sort of the thesis of the book. This book doesn't offer you transactional atonement. Jesus didn't die for your sins in the Gospel of Thomas. He doesn't perform miracles. He doesn't heal anybody. He's here to encourage a deepening and enriching awareness called Gnosis. And when you discover the hidden sayings of these teachings, then you are, to use the other word, saved. You are restored to your connection to the divine. So in a way, the opening line is kind of the thesis of the text. More on this point of Gnosis from verse 3. Jesus said, if your leaders say to you, look, the kingdom is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will precede you. That's kind of a joke. <laughs> if they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will meet you there. If I Rather, the kingdom is inside you and it is outside you. I think Jesus here is gently mocking the idea that heaven is a place. 
and instead affirming like that line in the loop that these that the, whatever we're talking, whatever the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God is, it is inside you and it is outside you. It is a sacred reality that we inhabit, both imminent and transcendent. And he goes on, when you know yourselves, then you will be known, and you will understand that you are children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, well, in poverty, and you are in poverty. Ah, and so now we get this further refinement of the idea of Gnosis, that yes, it is a kind of knowledge, but it is a kind of self-knowledge, that whatever we are looking for is present within. And so when you discover that divinity that you have within you, then that's what you are looking for. And if you don't have that self-knowledge, then you are cut off from your own infinite significance. What he's calling the kind of poverty thing. In verse, jumping way ahead to verse 67, one who knows all but is lacking in oneself is utterly lacking. More on that self-knowledge piece in the 70. If you bring forth what is within you, what you have will save you. If you do not have that within you, what you do not have within you will kill you. Jesus does this a lot in the canonical Gospels too. He sets up a binary. You can't lay your treasures in heaven and on earth. You, know, you have to pick one. And he's constantly saying, in either or, which is a really powerful way to communicate in an oral culture where nothing is written down. You give people a simple yes or no choice, a binary choice. Most of us know that it's usually both and, but that's that's for later. That's more necessary, right? At the beginning, you just sort of throw it down like this. Jesus said in 83, images are visible to people but the light within them is hidden in the image of the Father's light. He will be disclosed, but his image is hidden by his light. Maybe we can talk about that one afterwards. Because that was complicated to me, and the, the, the terms are moving around. But there's something going on, I feel like, in, in verse 83, about, again, cognition and consciousness and conceptual knowledge, which is a kind of imagery, isn't it? Um, conceiving of God in a very specifically defined way is a kind of idolatry. You're just worshiping your own idea, right? not what God is actually beyond all things and forms. So maybe there's something of that going on there in verse 83. A few more on Gnosis here. Verse 108. This is the one of the most famous lines in the Gospel of Thomas. Whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become that person, and the hidden things will be revealed to that person. So lines like this get people like Deepak Chopra really excited because this fits perfectly with Buddhism and Hinduism, particularly at Vaikya Vedanta. The idea that we are identical with the ground of being, only we don't know it. And so now again, I think we know what drinks from my mouth means to understand the sayings, like in verse 1. Whoever understands these sayings not only receives wisdom, but they become like me. And I myself shall become that person. That's God identification. And then the hidden things will be revealed to that, to that person. Maybe you're starting to, yeah, let, 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 me, let me go back to that for a second. Maybe you're starting to get a sense now why this book is not in the Bible. Um, in Roman Catholicism, the, the, the most beloved gospel is, is, is John. That's the one we find in most of the homilies inside of Catholic churches. It's, as I mentioned before, the one that offers the most full-throated defense of the idea that Jesus is God and that we are not. And our role then in that traditional Christian orientation is to accept Jesus into our lives, to love Jesus, to have a relationship with Jesus, but there's always a duality there. And through our relationship with Jesus and our imputation of Jesus into our life, God's grace then 
restores us, that's what atonement means, restores us to oneness or connection with God. And it can only come through Jesus. Even though in John, Jesus says, you know, I am one with God and that I am one with the Father and the Father is one with me and I am one with you and you are one with me and I am the vine and you are the branches. And last time I checked, vines and branches are one thing. So, you know, there, there are lots of rich images like that in the traditional Gospels that hint at a much more intimate oneness between us and the divine than we hear in some Christian circles. But here, it isn't subtle at all. It is what Jesus is here to teach us about is that we have always been one with God and know it. And to come into the knowledge of that. And that is a little too heretical for the early church fathers who are putting together the Gospels. Second thing, esoteric teachings. We've already read this one, but now let's look at it through the lens of this idea of hidden teachings versus public teachings. These are the hidden sayings of the living Jesus spoke. And whoever discovers their meaning will uh, become boundless. Can I put it that way? Will not taste death. How about Satipananda in Sanskrit? Boundless meaning, boundless truth, boundless bliss as opposed to identifying with this bag of meat, which is only going to be here for a few more years. So to identify with the boundlessness of our, of our being instead of the temporality of the form in which it is housed. Thirteen, oh, this is my favorite uh, passage in the whole gospel. I'm going to give you the whole of chapter 13. It's going to take two slides. It's the longest passage in the Gospel of Thomas, which is really short and compact. So here's the scene. This is the closest thing to a scene, also to a story in the whole Gospel. Jesus said to his followers, compare me to something and tell me what I am like. Ah, so this is, this is exam day in, in, in the Jesus school. And he gathers the disciples around him and he says, okay, oral exam. Tell me what I am like. Compare me to something. So Simon, there's always that kid. <laughs> so Simon Peter's like, hey. and he calls on Simon, and Simon Peter said to him, You are like a just messenger. Second student, Matthew, said to him, You are like a wise philosopher. Thomas. They always come to the three. It's just like a joke, right? A rabbi, a priest, and a mom walk into a bar. <laughs> so we got the we got the three rhythm here. Simon, Peter, Matthew, and then Thomas. Thomas says, Teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. That's a different kind of answer. And watch what happens next. Jesus says, I am not your teacher. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I have tended. So he starts with, I don't know if I call that a scold. But it is a correction. I don't know if the I am not your teacher, quote unquote, Jesus bumper sticker is ever going to catch on. <laughs> but it is a startling thing. And anybody in the room who is a therapist or a priest or a rabbi or a coach or a, or a in any kind of leadership position, there's something in psychotherapy or psychology in, in talk therapy called transplants. When under the guidance of a psychotherapist, you begin to feel better. You come out from underneath your neurosis, the, the, the fog and the pain start to lift. And you kind of fall in love with your therapist because you would very understandably associate your dawning liberation with them, with their shiny face. And what a professional risk this is for everybody in these positions to have the, the sick things who mistakes their own dawning wisdom with your presence. And I feel a little bit of that energy where Jesus is kind of saying, you know, especially to Simon Peter and Matthew, look, you guys, I'm sensing a little bit too much obsequiousness from you two. I think I like what Thomas just did a little bit better. Part two of chapter 13. Look what Jesus does next. 
Jesus took Thomas and withdrew and spoke three sayings to him, which are not in the text, by the way. When Thomas came back to his friends, they asked him, what did, what did Jesus say to you? Thomas said to them, if I tell you one of the sayings he spoke to me, you will pick up rocks and stone me, and fire will come from the rocks and consume you. <laughs> so people have wondered for 2,000 years what three things Jesus said to Thomas. And you can go online and you can find people guessing wildly about what that is. To me, that's not the most interesting part. Again, it's a story about esoteric wisdom. But clearly what we see here, it seems to me, is that Thomas passed the test. Thomas proved his readiness to receive this deeper teaching. He had moved past simply worshiping Jesus or praising Jesus' words and instead said right out loud, whatever you are, Jesus, is an ineffable mystery beyond words and concepts. The Tao that can't be told is not the eternal Tao. And because of that position, Thomas won the contest, was selected for the deeper teachings, which are not even in the book because apparently our heads would explode. <laughs> and, and, then, and then fire would come from our guts. I mean, I don't know. This, this is an incredibly vivid, wild language about the danger of esoteric language. Wonderful stuff. Um, a little more on that point. Jesus said in 62, I disclose my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You recognize that second line from the canonical Gospels. Um, here we have, we might say, crude ways of talking about really complex psychological realities of different parts of our psyche, our spirit, our temperament, our consciousness, being aware of different things, being in conflict with each other, egotism, and all the rest of that is sort of boiled in here. But again, that fundamental idea of those who are worthy and those who are unworthy. And I know that sounds so elitist, and so we have to kind of unpack that a little bit as we have been doing today and talk about the visceral way of putting it. Jesus says, do not give what is holy to dogs, or they might throw them upon the manure pile. Do not throw pearls to swine, or they might, and then it breaks into a fragment there. But we know that line from the canonical gospels, do not cast your pearls before swine as the King James Version has it. So, another warning again from Jesus lines up pretty well with the Synoptic Gospels about um, not only are some people not ready for these deeper mysteries, but if you gave the deeper mysteries to them, they would destroy them. They would chew them. That's what pigs would do with pearls. They, would, they wouldn't appreciate their beauty or their value. They would try to eat them and crush them into dust. So this is, these are portraits to me of a world that if you just backed up a dump truck and dumped all the world's wisdom out in the park over here, nobody would know, and it would just walk right by it. Is that Indian saying? Or it might be from the karate kid, I don't remember. <laughs> um, but the teacher is ready to speak a little here. You can take the most brilliant teacher on the planet and put it in front of a put her or him in front of an unready student, and nothing will happen. Confucius, from the Chinese tradition, puts it this way: Imagine the tabletop. I give a student one corner. If they can't bring back the other three, I stop teaching. That kind of teacher would get fired today. You have to give a student all four corners, and then some. But but that. That idea of, of the transference of wisdom, uh, the burden is on the student. And that's all through this as well, isn't it? All right, just a few more here, and we can start talking about some of these things. Um, oh, yeah, the same passage again, but now under the heading of the eschatology. If your leaders say to you, look, the kingdom is in heaven, and the birds of heaven will pursue you. 
They say to you, it is in the sea that the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside you, and it is outside you. It's the same sentiment, isn't it, that we see in the, in the synoptic gospels over and over where people ask Jesus, show us where the kingdom is so that we can find it. It's like, can you text it to me? Can you text me a Google map with a with a with a with a pin drop in it? You know, so I can so I can drive there. And Jesus is like, look at your phone. <laughs> don't look over here, don't look over there. It's not a place. This sounds a lot like the canonical gospels too. His followers said, Show us the place where you are, for we must seek it. <coughs> He said to them, whoever has ears should hear. There is a light within a person of life and it shines on the whole world. If it does not shine, it is dark. So there he is pointing inside of you again. And there we are looking outside of us to the leaders, to the charismatic teachers, to the celebrities, to the famous, to the rich, to the powerful. His followers said to him, when will the rest of the dead take place? And when will the new world come? He said to them, what you look for has come, but you do not know it. I could have put that passage in the Gnosis, the heading of Gnosis also, is all sort of working in different ways. So again, I often think of it this way in our, in our longing for God. We do not have a proximity problem. We have a perception problem. And the traditions that we engage in, the rituals that we engage in, help us move into the heightened perception, heightened awareness. They don't bring God any closer, because how could God be any closer? As Nisargadharta Maharaj, the great Vedanta teacher of the 20th century, put it, said, said um, <coughs> how do you say it? I hate it when I go for a quote, and I can't find it. It's in here somewhere. Um, something like, already home, you are asking for the way home. How can you, and he also said, how can we become what you already are? So whether it's like the Vedanta or, or mystical Christianity, we get the pitch over and over again that you already are what you are looking for. So the whole construct of seeking needs to be abandoned. As Meister Eckhart from our own tradition put it, God is not found by a process of addition, but by subtraction. What impediments do I need to remove so that I can experience the oneness that I have always been in, but have lost awareness of? They said to him, tell us who you are so that we may believe in you. They said, that one's going to go over. He said to them, you examine the face of heaven and earth, but you do, but, but you have not come to know the one who is in your presence, and you do not know how to examine this moment. We see this in the literature of Buddhism, too. Both Buddha and Jesus are not very good at giving pleasant answers. They seem to be instead gently mocking the question or saying, you're not even framing this inquiry correctly. I, it's like, I don't know how to answer your question. It's so unartfully framed. Instead, I challenge you to abandon that framework of inquiry and try something else. But he doesn't even say that. In 113, his followers said to him, when will the kingdom come? He answered, it will not come by watching for it. It will not be said, look, here it is, or look, there it is. Rather, the Father's kingdom is spread out upon the earth, and people do not see it. What a clear expression of what I'm terming realized eschatology. The kingdom of heaven, that's what this is. And that same dynamic is in Buddhism. You know, is nirvana something I'm supposed to arduously meditate my way toward with decades of severe spiritual discipline and austerity and practice, and then I'm here in, the, in samsara, but if I, if I meditate purely enough, I'll get to the mountaintop of nirvana, and the Mahayana Buddhists come in and just pull a pin out of the angry and blow up 
that whole construct is what you're in nirvana right now. You just don't know. Stop turning it into a, the, you know, the spiritual Olympics, reserved only for the most perfect practitioners. Nirvana is what we are always in. It's trying to explain water to a fish. But we can't help but think in those terms, and that's always the challenge. Finally, just a couple of slides on this, and we'll, we'll wrap up. Jesus said, I am the light that is over all things. I am all. From me, all has come forth, and to me, all has, has uh, reached. Split a piece of wood, I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. Now Jesus is talking like God. It's like, it's like chapter 11 and 12 of the Bhagavad Gita where Lord Krishna finally reveals his full divinity to poor, spiritual, aspiring Arjuna. His boyhood friend Krishna finally explains to him, yeah, I'm actually Lord Vishnu. And gives his friend Arjuna spiritual sight so that he can comprehend the infinite vastness of Vishnu's divinity. It's called a theophany, right? It's the burning bush scene in Exodus. When God shows himself to you. And so this is this is the theophany of the Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus says, lift up a stone, I am there. Break open a piece of wood, I am there. That's called pantheism. But I am the divinity within all forms. I'm not just housed in form, but I am unlimited and boundless and present in all matter, all energy, and all consciousness. The way we talk about the Holy Spirit in Trinitarian Christianity. So, that was a lot of different ideas from the Gospel of Thomas. In about 30 minutes, we spent the first 30 on just context, and the last 30 reading the text. I would love to uh, hear your thoughts, your, your, your questions, your comments. We have a microphone. And we would love your comment to be on the microphone because we are recording and folks, our YouTuber, don't want to hear your question. So does anybody have a thought or an idea? Please. Not that I have any answer, but I do have a book. <laughs> um, it, it reminds me very much of the Celtic religion oh, wow. uh, in Ireland, uh, in pre Roman. Mm -hmm. And their philosophy was that uh, the divine, that every living being, in fact, all of creation, has the divine spirit within it. And uh, furthermore, instead of saying that we're all terrible, sinful creatures, broken, you know, we're born, they said you are a child of God. You are sacred. You know, just very, very positive. Kind of reminds me. Thank you for that connection. You're right, and, and, it, and it brings to mind something that happens when Christianity travels around the world and, and encounters pre-Christian culture, whether in the British Isles or in Honduras or in India, uh, here in the Americas, in North, in North America. It often encounters primal religions, shamanic religious traditions, which are almost always um, non-dualistic or at least pantheistic. And, and so that's the, that's the interface that starts to happen. That flavor of Christianity becomes illuminated by, the, by its encounter with those local teachings. So don't think Christianity retains that, that more universalist uh, perspective than, say, other perspectives might. Nice. Yeah. Any other thoughts about your uh, encounter with the Gospel of the Thomas this morning? Thanks, but you appreciate it. I don't find uh, this gospel really that different from the canonical gospels when they are really read metaphorically rather than partially read literally. Because often when read in that latter way, they seem devoid of depth. Uh, I, I agree. That's my own view of it as well. And so it's a sort of rhetorical device to pit the Gospel of Thomas against the canonical Gospels. A great scholar on this uh, discussion, by the way, is um, Elaine Pagels, P-A-G-E-L-S. 
He's written quite a bit about the so-called Gnostic Gospels and has some wonderful videos on YouTube that lectures on this point. She has this wonderful thing where she kind of compares the Gospel of John with the Gospel of Thomas. In certain key ways, they are remarkably different. But she also acknowledges what you and I just agreed on that that they they it's, it's a question of influence almost. And like Joseph Campbell says, when you when you read myths literally, you you destroy them. You you suck the life out of them. And and far from getting the most meaning out of them, you lose all their meaning. So that's Joseph Campbell's perspective on this as well, that when we read the canonical gospels or the rest of Judeo-Christian scripture and, uh, metaphorically, uh, or at least multidimensionally, metaphorically and other ways, then all kinds of rich, beautiful um, meaning starts to arise. And then this book doesn't sound so radically uh, different. I, I, I like that. Please. Do we have any outside sources that say what the people who read these and held it dearly used it for. Such as, I mean, some of it sounds like Zen can all and say to think about, but a lot of stuff I've read, the new that we need to share here from the book is out out there. Like, did anybody get it or sit on it? Because some of it, I mean, we probably none of us can understand. Some of the stuff is just. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good, I love that. There's a couple of questions there. I'll start with the second one. There is stuff in that book that I that I that I left out because it's so crazy. And it's so um, easily misconstrued. Like there's some really I'll just I'll, I'll just get to it because if you do the research you're gonna stumble on anyway. There's some really through our kind of you know feminist consciousness, there's some really horribly sexist things that Jesus says about how women are hopelessly inferior to men. Um, and, and, and again, you know, footnotes and footnotes and footnotes and footnotes later, you start to realize, and, and especially when you put it in the context of how Jesus actually lived amongst the women and godly women, unlike the religious tradition of that he came from at that time, there was no reformed Judaism in the first century in Jerusalem. There were rabbis, right? So, so it looks like, just like, oh my god, that's really awkward. I'm just going to skip that passage. Um, and, and then you put it in this larger context that perhaps he's dealing with a kind of lexicon of metaphors and meanings there that are lost to us. At the, at the, your, the first part of your question, the people who, uh, many of the people who you know, use the Gospel of Thomas, we associate with a sect called Gnostic Christians. Lane Pagels argues very effectively that the Gospel of Thomas is in the end not a Gnostic text. I know we're getting a little inside baseball here. But the Gnostics were a kind of curious heretical group who believed that the God of the Bible was not the true God, he was a demigod, and there was a higher God above him. And the Gnostics were very dualistic. There was a war between good and evil. Frankly, it's a kind of Zoroastrianism, if you're into that. But anyway, then these, this, this gets pretty murky in a hurry. But I mentioned a few of those things in passing because there are problematic passages. And fundamentally, to your first question, we don't really know um, much about the early followers of, of, of any of these Christian groups. You know, this is still first and second century stuff. There was no church. Some communities had two letters of Paul and the Gospel of Mark. And then 100 miles down the road, maybe they had the Gospel of Luke and a couple other letters of Paul. And they read them in the homes, and that was it. So what you and I call Christianity had not been formed out of all those loose threads. And so I'm afraid it's a little bit lost to us. Who exactly were these people? What did they think it means? That's what makes the discovery of this text so tantalizing. But it's, it's, it's a little bit like finding, well, it's literally finding lost treasure and then not really knowing what it meant to the people who wrote it. And so it's a detective story. Yeah. Wonderful. How was breakfast? I've never spoken at breakfast before. It's the best thing I've ever seen. Well, any other thoughts uh, before we wrap up here? Please, we have a back here. I think, I think so 
I'm still laughing and sighing and sighing because I have said so much to a certain group of religious people who are very nice right now about. I have said many times, the kingdom is now. The kingdom is here, you just don't recognize. And here you quoted today that not only is it inside of us, but it's outside of us. And that heaven is here now, so is hell. It's what we make this earth every day a place of beauty as music joy or we make it a living hell. And every day we're experiencing it, contributing to it, and walking through many different lands, all in one little land here in this little city, with different ideas, groups of people coming from all over the planet. And each one of them special and gorgeous and beautiful and carrying inside of such a bright light. And they seem to find themselves here, leave this place, go out in the world and spread that light. When I grew up, my little town said, don't hide your light under a bushel. Right. Because the bushel will catch on. <laughs> so, I've heard that second part. I'm glad I came this morning. Oh, I like and thank you very much for your messages. And what, why didn't they ask Thomas? Because I think it was lost for centuries. And Thomas was a doubter. He doubted. And yeah. that little statement to sure. me, it will always be. Now you're going to business. That's what you mean, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's good to meet a fellow here at Parenting. Uh, let's, let's wrap up on that last question, which is why is this not the Bible? I, I think that we can see that the message of the Gospel of Thomas is, and I'll put it in sort of dramatic terms, it's kind of dangerous to the existence of the institution. Because if the Gospel of Thomas is true, what do I need an institution for? What do I need priests for? What do I need salvation for? Uh, ritual atonement and all the rest of it becomes optional as opposed to required. So that perhaps simply wasn't um, harmonious enough with the mission of the early church, which was working hard against a lot of different conflicting ideologies, cleaning house within itself. Elaine Pagel wrote another great book about that. It's called the History of Satan. Uh, and it's an urban it's a history of the first two centuries and how the church began to uh, amplify the idea of Satan and then identify Satan with all of its enemies, including especially heretics within its own church, who were preaching um, heretical Christologies and so on. Uh, so uh, that's why, that's another reason why Thomas was lost to us for so long, so it's an exciting time. I appreciate all of you, Lord, and everybody at home, and thanks for being here. This will wrap up to the church. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Peter. Uh, wonderful readings. So we appreciate you. Um, please know that uh, forums are back on for the rest of the program year. And next week, September 17th, this same bat time, same bat channel, we will have the Reverend Tom Matthewson from St. Luke's North Park with us to tell stories of St. Luke's pilgrimage to East Africa. I'm sure those of you who know Colin and Laura will ask about their newborn baby as well. So please come and join us next week. And again, thank you, Peter. We'll see you all soon. See you. Thanks. Good morning, St. Paul's. I am very grateful. Oh, that's good, good. I am very grateful to be here before you today as one of you. And a very special thank you to our cathedral dean, the very Reverend Penny Bridges, for her invitation to speak with you this morning. Yes, Penny invited me here, but if I say anything upsetting, the fault is entirely mine. And my email is peterboland at cox.net. So you can spare them the emails. Now, I was very excited when I got this assignment and when I saw the scriptural passages in today's liturgy, because here in our reading from the Hebrew Bible, from the book of Exodus, we get the origin story of the most foundational figure in the entire Judeo-Christian tradition, Moses. Yes, Abraham before him was a very big deal, but I think Moses is really where the story in many ways begins. And here today we have the beginning of his story. 
And as a professor of mythology and world religions and philosophy, I, I, I can't help but notice that Moses' story is an archetypal hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey? And what does it have to do with us? Well, in 1949, the great scholar of mythology and comparative religion, Joseph Campbell, published his first book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he suggested that the hero's journey narrative is a universal archetype found in all cultures, all centuries, and told again and again. And the surface details move around, but beneath the surface there is a core narrative that never varies. And Campbell mapped out the stages of this universal journey. And, and very, very briefly, the, to sketch it, you know, the hero almost always comes from very obscure origins, check, uh, leaves their known world voluntarily or involuntarily and is raised apart from their family of origin and goes through a series of ordeals and journeys and impossible tasks and somehow rises up eventually to claim the boon, the prize, the treasure that will move the world a little closer to the ideal. So the story of Moses is a hero's journey as is the story of Abraham before him, and as is the story of Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and Gilgamesh and Frodo and Harry Potter and Luke Skywalker and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you. Because even though we're used to looking outside of ourselves for the hero, Campbell's most powerful assertion is this that each of us is really the hero of our own lives, and that all of the hero's journey stories are really our story. They are mirrors held up for our deepest reflection. So as we consider the story of Moses this morning, we are invited, I think, to ask ourselves, what's my work? What must I leave behind in order to be of service? In order to become who I really am? In order to become an instrument? And so the next thing I notice about the Moses story is that this is an enslavement story told from the point of view of the enslaved, which would make this story illegal in about a dozen states today. There, children would instead be learning about the nobility of the enslavers, the superiority of their culture, and about their beneficent rule over the enslaved and how the Hebrews, through their bondage, were gaining valuable life skills, like pyramid building, perhaps. Again, Peter Boland at Cox.net. <laughs> oh no, he's getting political. Well, that's the third thing I notice about the Moses story. It's overt political theme. I mean, this is a political story. I've spoken in churches, you know, over a hundred times, and I'm, I'm nearly always invited back. Uh, but I'm often cautioned by sensible church leaders, you know, not to get political. And I take that to heart, and they're right to say that, and I agree. The pulpit cannot, by law, be a place where specific candidates or propositions are either uh, spotlighted or denigrated, so I won't do any of that, by name anyway. But I notice that Holy Scripture is not bound by any of those restrictions. Like so much of the rest of the Hebrew Bible, today's passage from Exodus is startlingly unambiguous and nuance-free on this point. The Egyptians are the bad guys. The Hebrews are their victims and slavery is an unmitigated evil. This is a clear portrait of a horribly unjust political system with a cruel, inhumane, and autocratic structure replete with the wholesale slaughter of children. Th this is a nightmare scenario from which the system cannot save us because the system is the nightmare. 
I keep thinking about what Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his immortal letter from a Birmingham jail when he wrote that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. So when the system that is supposed to protect us ends up enslaving and exploiting us, what are we supposed to do? We have to go around it. We have to look elsewhere for our deliverance. And the hero's journey, I think, and Moses' journey models for us what that looks like. But here's the saving grace, literally. God favors the free. God's will is our freedom. God's will is freedom for the oppressed. The text, I don't think, can be read any other way. Enslavement bad, freedom good. The enslavers, the oppressors, the book burners have always been and will always be on the wrong side of history, even if they appear to be winning occasionally. So the Exodus story for me has traditionally been so powerful and it has traditionally been read in its own source tradition, Judaism, as an allegory of all of our journeys from bondage to liberation. Talk about an archetype. So our task in this body of Christ, I believe, must be to zoom out and continue to work for the alleviation of the suffering of all sentient beings, as goes the Bodhisattva vow of Buddhism to work for the alleviation of the suffering of all sentient beings. What the Hebrew scriptures call justice and righteousness. To continue to plant trees whose shade we will never rest beneath and whose fruit we will never taste. In all of our freedom work, in all of our social justice work, we are working for changes we, we, we may never live to see. You know, Moses never made it back to Israel. He wasn't working for himself. We are not working for our own freedom. We are working for the freedom of those who come after us, of the seventh generation after us. And how do we do the work? There's so much wisdom in these traditions about that. How do we do the work? Working in the consciousness of service not control, in a stance of humility, not arrogance, in the consciousness of fluidity, not rigidity, embracing our uncertainty and leaving room for God in all of our efforts. As Gandhi said, it is for us to do the work, but the results are always in God's hands. Or as Krishna told Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, you have the right to work, but you do not have a right to the fruits of work, to work without attachment to outcomes. And what is it to take action in the consciousness of surrender, of faith, to take action in the spirit of renunciation? It is to realize or to make real the joy of knowing that when we show up selflessly without attachment to outcomes and offer our gifts in service, the ends will take care of themselves. This is the great message of all the world's wisdom traditions. This, in the end, is the message also of all the hero's journey stories that it was never about the hero. It was about the way the hero's selfless sacrifices awakened everyone and everything around them. Perhaps this is the living sacrifice Paul refers to in our passage from Romans this morning, when he wrote, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This shift 
of viewing your life as a holy sacrifice is to be, in Paul's words, transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is Paul's exhortation to each of us to experience metanoia in the Greek, or new mind, new thinking, higher consciousness. Metanoia often translated in the Gospels traditionally as redemption. As Einstein famously said, a problem cannot be solved at the same level of consciousness that created it. It is not answers to our questions we want. It is to move past the place where our questions have power over us. It is not solutions to our problems that we really want. It is to move past the place where our problems have power over us. This is the exodus of Moses. This is the hero's journey out of bondage and toward liberation and metanoia to be, as Paul says, transformed by a renewing of our minds. And I'll close with Paul's closing image, a favorite image of his, each of us as members of one body, so that we each have, quote, gifts that differ according to the grace given us. In other words, none of us alone has ownership of the solution. It's kind of a relief, isn't it? We are fingers on one hand, strings on a lute, drops of water in one life-giving river. Yes, our unique individual lives have infinite significance, but our deeper meaning lies in our relationships with one another. and with the nameless sacred source coursing through everything as everything. And on the hero's journey of our lives, just as in all the classic hero's tales, the trials we endure introduce us to our strengths. Our suffering burns away from us all that is inauthentic, all that is false, all that is second-hand, all that offends the soul until we stand stripped, empty, and ready to be the vessel for that grace we came here to be. May these words, humbly offered, be prayerfully received, and may their value be measured by the steps of your own hero's journey. Amen.